Yes, I'm uh, Mark Curry, Acting Executive Director, Local Government Victoria. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do today really is just to step you through at a high level where we are, is I guess the, the, the uh, perspective that I'm coming from. What do we know about the rate capping system uh, that we've seen so far in the process? What don't we know? Um, I think it's important to be clear about the roles and responsibilities of the different players. So what, what is LGV's role in this system? Uh, what is ESC's role? And uh, they are quite distinct and I think that's important to make that clear. Then I, I'd just uh, like to make some general observations about why we're here in this room talking about rate capping or fairer rating or fair go rating or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'll just call it rate capping today, if that's okay. Um, and some ob general observations about the financial uh, status and health of the sector. Um, quite preliminary general sort of observations. And then just some conclusions about the challenges and the opportunities that this whole process uh, provides uh, for the sector and for the state. Okay, so um, important to note that we were nearly a, a year since we first heard about this possibility. It was May 2014 that the now Premier uh, put out a release that the uh, 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 an Andrews Labor government would um, uh, require councils to cap their rates at the consumer price index and, and justify any further increases and to do that um, by making a case to the Essential Services Commission. So um, this has been on the cards for a little while. Of course we didn't know the outcome of the election but um, it's certainly a, a commitment that we've known about for some time. The commitment was confirmed fairly early on in the life of this government by the Minister, uh, Natalie Hutchins, uh, when she, um, she communicated <coughs> with all mayors and CEOs and confirmed that the, the process would proceed of implementing rate capping, but not this year. Importantly, not this year, next financial year. And I think that was a very important early decision not to overly rush the process to give time for considered uh, consultation with the sector and design of a system that's suitable for Victoria. So I think that was a very important early um, uh, decision that was taken. And then in February, uh, a month or so later, um, the Minister also confirmed that the ESC would in fact be responsible for designing the system effectively or making recommendations to the government on the design of the system. And uh, the ESC was issued with terms of reference which uh, you, you probably all had a chance to have a bit of a, a look at. Um, I think criti critical to that confirmation, if you like, was the fact that the ESC is an independent expert body, expert in economic regulation uh, in, in this state. And I think that independence and expertise is a very important um, and encouraging element of, uh, of, the, of the process as well, of input to the process. The terms of reference themselves are well worth a look at because they then take us into that next level of the government's um, policy thinking, if you like, what is it that's important to the government uh, in this process of um, uh, rate capping or preparing a rate capping system. I've just bolded what I think are some of the key um, policy considerations in, in, in the terms of, they're set out in the terms of reference. Cost of living pressures, <coughs> I think um, the main driver of the government in, in putting forward this proposal. Council autonomy sits in the objectives as well, so uh, as uh, was alluded to um, um, by Andrew and, and Sebastian. Autonomy of the local government sector is also an important consideration. Accountability and transparency, all of these are kind of buzzwords or fashionable words, but they're all important elements of the objectives and the policy setting uh, of, this, of this initiative. Efficient and stable rates reflective of community needs, also important, but also sustainability of councils. I think, I think um, that, that's a lot of considerations, some of them um, you could argue competing with each other in some ways. So that there is quite a trick in, in delivering this, um, this initiative in balancing up those objectives and producing the outcome, particularly uh, downward pressure on cost of living increases through rates, which is, is the desired outcome. Yeah. <coughs> Further, the terms of reference uh, are also illuminating in, in terms of the kind of things that, that, that the SE is being asked to look at the impact of successive above CPI rate increases, um, the base to which rate capping should apply. So that's not set in stone. Uh, is it just um, mm -hmm. rate revenue? Is it service rates and charges? More, more other aspects of more general revenue. So that's a key uh, <coughs> for, the, for the ESC's design and recommendations. Um, also, the third dot point there, I think, is um, perhaps almost the most significant, refinements to the nature and application of the cap that could better meet the government's objectives. So we've started with uh, a CPI, strongly CPI-linked commitment, 
but clearly the terms of reference do make provision for the ESC to make recommendations to the government if they if they come up based on their engagement with the sector and their consideration with uh, a, a more appropriate benchmark or way of delivering uh, on, on, the, on the broader outcome of downward pressure on uh, the, the level or the rate of rate increases. Uh, and the, the final point there too is also very important. Simplicity in administration and understanding. Um, not, not to build a huge complex edifice, but to make something that's understandable readily to the community, but also to the sector, and that can be delivered without having to uh, overly engineer the system, if, we, if that can be delivered. <coughs> we all also know, and this came out early, uh, along with the government's commitments, that in, in making cases, uh, where councils would make cases for exemptions to the rate cap, that there were certain factors that were acknowledged by the government as being important uh, considerations for the ESC to take into account. So uh, the impacts of population growth uh, impacting on some municipalities, some uh, categories of municipalities, the fact that the Commonwealth Government has put a freeze on, on grants, um, additional re requirements, responsibilities, taxes, charges, levies, um, uh, required to be uh, um, uh, administered by local government, collected by local government is another factor. Of course, there are unforeseen circumstances, extraordinary circumstances, if you look at New South Wales at the moment and uh, the impact of those uh, climatic events on some of the councils up there, I can imagine that's going to have a major impact on some of those councils. Those sorts of issues um, need to be taken into account. And also on, on, the, on the revenue side, the, the extent of availability of other sources of revenue other than rate revenue to councils, and that's variable across the sector, as we know. The other thing we know is some broad milestones, and Ron will talk about uh, these and the process in more detail, but we know the ESC has now um, published its initial consultation paper. We've got copies here today, it's just out. Um, so that's, uh, I think, submissions required by mid-May, so this is a very important um, time to start to engage with the process. Um, ESC draft report around mid-July, a final report required to the ministers, and I say ministers because it's the Minister for Local Government, but also the Finance Minister, who've commissioned this work by the end of October and uh, from our perspective, LGV's perspective, we would, uh, we would expect or would need to have any required legislation in place by very early uh, in the new year in order to uh, have a system up and running uh, in 16-17. So what don't we know? Uh, I won't spend long on this, but there are 22 questions in the ESC's consultation paper which we don't yet know the answer to and uh, hopefully everyone in this room can help us find what the answer is to those questions. Um, they're the known unknowns, uh, to quote the Secretary of State or whatever. There are also probably a bunch of unknown unknowns. Uh, there will be questions, issues that arise in the course of this process which we haven't necessarily <coughs> considered or canvassed uh, or the ESC hasn't necessarily canvassed in the discussion paper and they will need to be addressed as we go forward as well. Roles and responsibilities. Um, as I said, I think it's important to be clear about the distinction between the state government, LGV's role, and the ESC's role. So um, I would put it this way, that L LGV's role broadly is to provide general advice to the minister on local government matters. That's legislation, regulation, and broad policy matters. Um, LGV is not designing this system. The ESC is designing the system or recommending the system to the government. Um, uh, but uh, LGV has been involved in the broad advice to the Minister uh, coming in to, about methods or approach to implementing this uh, commitment. So broad advice about time frames, broad advice about terms of reference for the ESC, and I would imagine uh, a request for some advice when the ESC finishes its design process and provides reports to the Minister. Um, we will also, obviously, uh, we're talking to the ESC, we're independent, but where we can provide useful information or analysis, we will and have been doing that to, to assist the ESC, and obviously where we can support consultation or communication exercises, we'll be involved in that. Um, we're also, um, as I mentioned, as it's sort of implied, involved in um, making sure that there is an appropriate legislative framework to implement the, the, the design of the system which the ESC comes forward with. This is a slightly tricky process given that we don't know the design yet, but we have to be contemplating legislation being introduced into Parliament during this year uh, so that it can be um, uh, ideally passed early next year um, or by early next year so we can implement the system. There is an open question about how complex that legislation needs to be 
how, uh, how substantial, whether it's just a tweak of the existing legislation or some tweaks to facilitate or whether it's more substantial and that will partly depend on our sort of iteration and consideration <coughs> with the ESC on that matter. Um, there's also, um, the Minister has also announced her intention to establish what she's called, I think, a sector panel, which would be a panel uh, of um, uh, key stakeholder representatives from the sector and other uh, interested parties to provide advice to her during this process. I think we'll be hearing very shortly, next couple of days, about the, um, the establishment and the composition of that panel. Um, the ESC has undertaken to consult <coughs> regularly, liaise regularly with that panel during the course of, of uh, this process that they're conducting. <coughs> the EC, on the other hand, has a clear remit. It's got to undertake an independent inquiry. In doing that, it's got to conduct wide consultation with the sector. Um, it's got to provide advice on options and a recommended approach to ministers. Um, we hope that uh, we'll, we'll work closely on legislative facilitating frameworks. <coughs> and um, unless there's some major uh, change in what the ESC recommends, I think the ESC will be administering the system uh, once it's designed and, and operational. Okay, so just some general observations um, that I thought was worth just putting out there. Um, so why are we here? Why are we talking about rate capping? And um, I think this diagram, which is sourced from annual financial statement data that LGV's been, been collecting for a long time from uh, financial reporting, uh, revenue from council rates and charges has grown by an average of 8% per annum since 2000. Uh, that's compared with CPI typically 2 to 3%, local government cost index maybe a percent higher, maybe around 4%, certainly at a rate higher than any other state or jurisdiction in the country, except perhaps for Western Australia, which is comparable, maybe a little bit higher, but certainly significantly higher than most other states. Um, so. Um, that, that and the indication that that, um, that rate of growth uh, in forward projections through strategic resource planning and so on was likely to continue relatively unabated, um, I think is the reason that we're here talking about rate capping today. Uh, You've got a breakdown on how much of that is record population growth versus the actual yeah. percentage increase in rates? Yes, so, so um, the, and I'm talking in broad figures here, 8% is the total revenue growth from rates and charges. If it's sort of uh, uh, controlled for um, population growth or <coughs> a number of assessments growth, so that's a, it's about it's this line here. It's about six percent per annum on a per assessment basis, on average since 2000. Still significantly higher than the other benchmarks and the other states. What is the financial health of the sector? And again, just very broad preliminary observations, but worth throwing into the mix. <coughs> And, the, and these observations are sector-wide aggregated up, so I have to obviously acknowledge that there's great variability in the sector, that different categories of councils are under different sorts of pressures. We've got interface councils with growth pressures, we've got small rurals with declining population and, uh, and, and, and uh, limited revenue sources and the like. But basically, uh, what, what's suggested here is that in, a, in terms of overall sustainability of the sector, the sector is healthy. There's a relatively low number of councils that are identified by Vargo as being sust high sustainability risks. It's uh, a handful generally. Uh, and, and that's in the context that there have been relatively major sh shocks that the, uh, the sector has had to absorb in recent times. So I've noted the, there the um, defined benefit scheme uh, shortfall call of $453 million which had to be absorbed by the sector. Um, financial delayed payment of um, financial assistance grants and the like. Second point, uh, the net worth of councils has been growing consistently from uh, about 39, 40 billion in 2003 to 70 billion today. Over the past 10 years, expenditure on infrastructure in Victoria has doubled to about $2 billion per annum. Um, debt levels in Victoria, amongst Victorian councils in the sector as a whole are very low, a half to a third typically of the average of other states. So debt is not being, has not been used significantly uh, in, in Victoria as a means of, as a source of funding for uh, aspects of council expenditure. Sorry, Mark, yep. can we be getting access to these slides at some point, rather than us really quickly trying to... Yeah, they're, they're available. Yep. Yep. I think they've got hand out yeah. and, and finally, in terms of, um, I suppose in terms of the cash position of councils also has been improving and growing over the last 10 years. So, so um, I, I'm going to sort of let you draw your own conclusions, but what I'm suggesting is that on a sector-wide basis, um, and recognising variability in the sector, um, 
there does appear to be some scope or some capacity for this sector to absorb a more constrained <coughs> forward expenditure outlook um, without fundamentally compromising service delivery or um, infrastructure expenditure side. Now that'll be the source of great debate and as I say there's lots, lots of variability. I'm just talking from a broad aggregate sector wide perspective. So uh, in terms of uh, challenges uh, in, in conclusion, so no one's going to pretend that rate capping is not a contentious exercise. It's been contentious wherever it's been done. It's going to be contentious here. You just need to look at the reporting and it's contentious. But um, and it does raise the kind of hoary old chestnut debate about um, the autonomy of the sector versus prescription by the state uh, about what the sector can do and how it can behave. But we're not going to uh, resolve that debate and I don't think it will ever be resolved. Um, but that is a, certainly a challenge um, uh, in terms of this, this process. Um, it's also clear there are many demands on the local government sector. So you've got demands um, from below and from above. Other <coughs> levels of government placing demands, the, your local communities placing demands on the sector. Um, so that, that is a challenge, an ongoing challenge that still has to be dealt with in this context. Um, so that is going to require, there's no doubt, proactive management by councils to manage these demands uh, and to engage closely with communities to, to do the necessary hard priority setting that's going to be required coming out of this uh, process. But in terms of opportunities, and I'd like to think that the opportunities are at least as great as the challenges or greater, um, it is going to be a reality, um, but there is a significant opportunity, as I started out saying, to shape the, the model or the design of the framework that's uh, going to be implemented in Victoria. Um, it can be customised to Victoria's uh, circumstances and I think that's very important and that opportunity is, um, it's critical that that opportunity is taken up to get the best outcome here. It does also create a context for councils to fundamentally, to pause if you like and do a fundamental review of the activities and service provision that councils are involved in and approaches to financial management use of balance sheets and so on to create a more sustainable future for the sector. It does create that strong context for re-engagement or stronger engagement with the local community because engagement now is going to be, uh, in a sense, more meaningful because the, the, the reality is that there is going to be a smaller pool of resources going forward than has been the case in the last 10 or 15 years to be allocated across those competing priorities. So in conclusion, I'd just like to urge you all to take advantage of the opportunities uh, and make the best uh, of, of what they provide for us. Thank you.